Today's video is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. Hey, brother! Guys, as you may have deduced, I've read the Harry Potter books a lot and watched the movies also a lot. And as a result, sometimes the lines like blur inside of my mind to the point where I'll be reading a passage in the book and I will be so convinced that it was actually a scene from the movie. But then as I think harder and try to really visualize that scene, I'm like, is it in the movie? Does that ever happen to you? I'm like seriously asking because when we're creating these videos, a lot of times we'll be like writing along and then we'll say like, oh, include the clip of Harry saying, you don't need to call me sir, professor, but then it's not in the movie. But no, that glorious line for whatever unexplained reason is left out of the movie. Next, you're gonna tell me that my favorite line from the entire Harry Potter series also isn't in the movies. I know what your nickname is, Potter. Not in the movie. Also technically not really even in the books. The book says that it says, I understand what a nickname is. I hate it when the book gets it wrong. Although fun fact, literally just now as of recording this, I only just realized that that was like an itty bitty nod to literally the title of the book that that line is in because Half-Blood Prince is quite literally Snape's nickname. Although to be clear, it's not what his friends call him, just what he calls him, which is a little sad. <laughs> anyway, today we thought it would be fun to count down the top 10 moments that were left out of the movies. Here we go. Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, the Ridge Wallet. The Ridge Wallet is light, sleek, and industrial. It doesn't fold or awkwardly bulge in your back pocket. In fact, it was actually designed to go in your front pocket. Guys, it is no question that for years, I was carrying around this old overstuffed leather wallet with so much unnecessary stuff packed inside of it. It may as well have been an actual briefcase. And I can't be entirely sure because it's been faded from age, but I'm relatively certain that my 10th grade biology final was in there. My wallet was bulky and annoying, but now it is sleek and streamlined. The Ridge Wallet can hold up to 12 cards and still has room for cash and comes in 30 different colors and designs, including this one here, which is the stone washed. A new wallet is one of those things that many people just don't think to get for themselves. And that's what makes it such a great gift and one they'll actually use. And the Ridge team is so sure that you're going to love it that they will give you 45 days to give it a test drive. And if you don't love it, then you can send it back for a full refund. But when you or they end up loving it, good news. It comes with a lifetime warranty. So if you want to get 10% off your order with free shipping worldwide and free returns, you can do so by going to ridge.com slash SCB. Again, that is 10% off when you go to ridge.com slash SCB. Link is in the description down below. Real quick before we dive in, I fully understand and appreciate the fact that making movies with this massive world to try to pack in there is going to be very difficult. Not everything's gonna make it. So I get that. This is me just complaining for, you know, the sake of, I think it's fun. Today's list was actually very difficult to narrow in on because there are quite a few things that were ultimately left out of the movies, but we turned to our Discord server and man, oh man, did they deliver with some good ones. But don't you worry, we did group a few things together so we can include more things in the list. So without any further, Further ado, number one. I mean, number 10. One with a zero, because we're counting down. Peeves. This one was so heavily requested and may have actually been much higher on the list, except I actually kind of understand his absence. He often causes plenty of trouble and can serve as a comic relief, but it's also pretty rare for Peeves to actually be directly involved with like the overarching plots. Although fun fact, he was actually planned to be in the first movie and there are reportedly scenes that were shot, including Peeves being portrayed by Rick Mayall. But those scenes seem to be left on the edit room floor and have never been released in any medium. Most of his antics are just replaced with Filch and it works for the most part, but it would have been really nice to have seen him introduce and break the vanishing cabinet, introduce Moaning Myrtle, torment, Umbridge, which mostly I really just want in there because there's that moment when McGonagall tells him to like turn the screw the other way to get the chandelier to fall. And I thought that was awesome. But worst of all, we never got to see Peeves suffer at the hands 
of Wadi Wasi. If you know, you know, and you know that I'm also a little bit frustrated about that one. Number nine, The Goblet of Fire. And I know what you're thinking, Ben, The Goblet of Fire was in the movie. We saw it, remember? And I agree, we did. That's the only thing we saw. Yeah, to be honest with you, this video literally could have almost been called the top 10 things they left out of The Goblet of Fire. But instead, we decided to just group all of those things together. The Goblet of Fire, here's what they left out. The Quidditch World Cup? Like, what? You almost could have titled it the 10 things they left out of the Quidditch World Cup. The game, Ludo Bagman, Winky. Did I mention the game? By the way, Winky, like, She's so important to the story. She gives us so much critical backstory to the Crouch family. She makes Barty Crouch Sr. seem way more sus. Am I using that correctly? For clarity, in case I wasn't using it correctly. Suspicious that he may have put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire. Winky is also the reason we get to visit the Hogwarts kitchen which we don't do at all. Which also means that Dobby's not there. Everyone wants more Dobby. Also then, Spew. Uh, S-P-E-W. It's Spew. But going back to the cup, there was no Ludo Bagman, which meant there was no betting, which means that Fred and George didn't lose their money to him unfairly, which means that when Harry ultimately wins the Triwizard Tournament and gets a thousand galleons and he gives it to them to start the joke shop, none of that matters. Ludo Bagman, by the way, also sus. I think I'm getting it. They included the leprechauns for Ireland, but not the Vilas for Bulgaria, which means that Fleur was no longer part Vila. To be fair, Clemence Posey does not need magic assistance to make her more beautiful, but it sure does make Ron look a lot worse when he fails to ask her out. In the books, he's like under the spell of her Vila-ness, but in the movies, he's just shallow, which he is, but still. Also, no Rita Skeeter as an Animagus, and no harassing Hagrid, and no Hagrid raising blast-ended Scroots. Which I was disappointed about because it was an animal that I could never really picture and I wanted to see what it looked like. It was like the how to pronounce Hermione's name of magical creatures. We called her Hermoine growing up. But on the note of Scroots, it meant that Harry doesn't get to fight one in the maze. And while we're talking about the maze, oh my gosh, the maze. No golden mist, no boggart, no acromantulas, no sphinx. The middle of middle is D, it's a spider. I wanted to see Harry be smart. No, but seriously, like last time we got to see Harry go through an obstacle course like this, he had Ron and Hermione with him, kind of backing him up. And this time it was going to be really fun to see Harry sort of like thrive with his own prowess. But instead we get like, kind of spooky hedges. And if I'm being real with you, I didn't think they were even that spooky. Okay, I'm lying, they were terrifying. And somehow we're only at number eight, the potions riddle in Philosopher's Stone. In the books, the potions riddle is the final obstacle before Harry is able to make it to the mirror and the Philosopher's Stone. And it's the challenge that Hermione gets to be the champion of. The movie cuts the scene all together and Hermione gets to be the champion of the Devil's Snare Chamber, which I guess is ultimately fine. Harry does the keys and Ron, of course, does the chess set. But giving the Devil's Snare to Hermione causes just one small problem and that's Harry remains calm in the books during that moment, which I think is kind of a key characteristic of how he is under pressure. It's demonstrating his early ability to be a leader. The problem is here when Hermione tells Harry that he's all brave and stuff and that he should be the one to go on. In the book, Harry is the one that lulled Fluffy to sleep and he was the first one through the trap door and he remained calm with the devil's snare and he caught the key. Him going ahead first, makes sense. In the movie, we haven't even seen him cast a spell. Hermione, however, casts Wingardium Leviosa. She's the one that sets Snape's cloak on fire. She unlocks a door, incapacitates Neville, and defeats the Devil's Snare. So it really kind of feels like she should be the one going through the door, not Harry. Although to be fair, I think Hermione is the hero of the books. So <laughs> number seven, the Dursleys. Now this one actually possibly could have been included back with number nine, the Goblet of Fire, because they weren't in it at all. And you might be thinking, well, Ben, it kind of makes sense. I mean, they really blew up the Dursleys budget back in POA. To which I say, wow, I get it. Clever pun blew up because of Aunt Marge. 
Oh, you. But does that explain Half-Blood Prince? Where instead of getting to watch Dumbledore be like aggressively polite to the Dursleys and having goblets like gently prodding their heads, we get a scene of Harry at a cafe like checking his breath. Oh, and don't forget when he observes this way less clever pun about magic, you have to look very carefully right here. You get it? It says magic and they can do magic. I'm not even actually sure that qualifies as a pun. But the Dursleys not being in Goblet of Fire means that we don't get to see the Weasley twins give Dudley the tongue tongue toffee. Another scene of just pure joy that we don't get to see. And it also kind of introduces this actual ambition of the Weasley twins to start a joke shop, which again, Harry later funds, which again, later we don't see. Because no Ludo Bagman, who is sus. I think. But that's okay, because in the movies, the Weasley twins, despite being very, very poor, are able to fund it on their own anyway, in a prime location in Diagon Alley. So it all works out. Also a Dursley moment that is kind of maybe an honorable mention because they actually did shoot it, they just didn't include it, is the moment where Dudley oh so lovingly tells Harry that he doesn't think he's a waste of space. But it's okay, it's okay, because you know how much Dudley actually loves Harry because he later moves to Kentucky, changes his name to Harry and becomes a state chess champion. I mean, how good was the Queen's Gambit? Number six, Snape calls Lily a mudblood. This is kind of a smaller one, but I still feel like it's vital to this list because it represents the moment that Snape basically loses the friendship of Lily. Without this moment, the viewer doesn't really have any actual explanation as to why these two stopped being friends other than she ultimately ended up marrying James who was only ever portrayed as a brat. Although to be fair, I'm pretty sure in the books, James is pretty much exclusively only also ever a brat. Something that is later clarified with a conversation between between Harry, Lupin, and Sirius when he's in the fireplace, which is a scene they also didn't include in the movies. The point is in the movies, it really makes Snape's like lost love seem that much more tragic when in actuality, Snape is pretty much at the root of the problem. But it's okay because instead we got a bunch of really odd scenes of Snape hugging her dead body, which definitely doesn't happen in the books and I wish didn't happen in the movies. Number five, Lupin offering to help the Golden Trio. In the books, this happens in Deathly Hallows when the trio is hiding out at Grimwald Place and Lupin shows up trying to join the cause and help them out. Basically saying, I was your defense against the Dark Arts teacher. I am in the Order of the Phoenix. You don't even have to tell me what you're doing, but I might be of assistance. It is a tempting offer, but Harry says, no way, man. Actually, it's way more intense than that. He yells at him for the very notion of him even considering leaving his pregnant wife to come and join them on this escapade. The point is, it is a very emotionally charged scene and it beautifully accomplishes two things. First is that Harry has to be an adult to an adult and dish out some really hard truths, which demonstrates just how much Harry understands about the power of both family and love. And second, I think it really drives home how alone the trio are in this endeavor. They cannot rely on anyone else's help. No one is coming, no one to call, succeed, or die. I mean, to be fair, in the end, plenty of people do end up helping, but it's the feeling of this loneliness that matters. Number four, Creature's Tale. While we're at Grimwald Place, let's go ahead and talk about the other resident of Grimwald Place, Creature. Because man, if anyone has a great redemption arc, it's him. Not only does he provide valuable information about the backstory of the locket, but he also redeems Regulus Black and is the clear example of the transformative powers of kindness. He starts off by betraying Sirius and getting him killed and ends with literally leading an army of house elves against the Death Eaters. Which, by the way, that scene also left out. Number three, the Janus Thicky Ward. Specifically, St. Mungo's. Oh, M goodness movies. Why would you leave this out when it is pretty obvious that there was some additional character development that we needed and wanted to see? I, of course, speak of the one, the only, Neville's parents. This has got to be one of the most emotional moments from the entire book series. It's the backstory for Neville's shy bumblingness, his core motivations. This. I can't even believe I'm gonna say this, 
is one of the few things the Goblet of Fire actually did a good job of setting up well. Neville's like visceral reaction to the Cruciatus Curse. It shows you, rather than telling you, the real damage that Bellatrix Lestrange can cause. It gives you true reason to fear her later on in the Department of Mysteries. And it makes you feel the real power of Neville's motivation to get better at magic in all the DA meetings. Don't tell me you didn't tear up when he puts the bubblegum wrapper in his pocket. Plus, 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 we could have seen Mr. Weasley try and explain getting stitches, which would have been hilarious. And also, Lockhart, anyone, please, more, a little bit, <laughs> right? What do you mean that's the general idea? Number two, the rest of Dumbledore's lessons to Harry and Half-Blood Prince. Pop quiz, do you know which character gets the most amount of screen time in Infinity War? It's Thanos. Yeah. The villain, because when you're about to end a 22 movie saga, you really want the audience to understand where they're coming from. Evil because evil is boring. Half-Blood Prince, the book, does a fantastic job of accomplishing this task as it pertains to Voldemort, showing you several key moments in not only his past, but also his family's past. You get to see all of the moments that led to his creation and why he is the way that he is. And now I'm not saying that Tom Riddle deserved the most amount of screen time or anything, but all we really get is that he was kind of mean as an orphan and that he asked Slughorn about Horcruxes. Considering this is the first time we ever hear what Horcruxes are, that is not enough development. Where? are the pure blood manic Gaunt family. The Gaunts are pretty important here. They explain just about everything, including why the ring is important, why the locket is important, his connection to Slytherin, what happened to his mom and dad, why he was at an orphanage. Also, the visit with Hepzibah Smith shows Harry the locket and the cup, and just shows how compelling and charming Tom Riddle could actually be. In the books, the meeting between Dumbledore and Tom Riddle explains the curse of the Defense Against the Dark Arts position and ultimately points Harry in the right direction on how to find the diadem. These are all such crucial moments. I literally think that 25% of this movie could have just been memories and nobody would have bat an eye. Instead, Voldemort, you know, the main villain got four minutes and 15 seconds of screen time, just a mere 45 seconds more than Lavender Brown. You see this moment here where she's drawing a heart with like her breath in the window? Could have been anything else. <sighs> that brings us to number one, Harry repairing his holly wand with the Elder Wand. Guys, I've simply lost track at this point in time just how many videos we have actually made about the true path of the Elder Wand or who was actually the master of it when, if ever. But the one constant thing that no matter what has always been true is that we know that Harry is the true master of the Elder Wand when he uses that wand to repair his Holly Wand, which is simultaneously also proof that the Elder Wand is in fact more powerful than other wands. Ollivander explains to Harry that it is an impossible task. He tries it with other wands and it fails. It's the proof we needed that Harry is in fact the master of death, the master of the Elder Wand. To be fair, he also comes back from the dead, so that's pretty solid. I'll give him that. The one thing that I do that I'm actually completely fine with is the breaking of the Elder Wand. Like, I'm not concerned with that decision at all, except for the fact that Harry didn't repair his wand first, so now he doesn't have a wand. And guys, there you go. The top 10, basically 30 moments that we felt like were left out of the movies that should have been in there. For my question of the day, what did we miss? What were your moments that you wanted to see that didn't make it in there? Let us know in the towel section down below. But guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to see our list of top 10 cringe moments from the Harry Potter movies, you can do so by checking out right up there. But otherwise, until next time, bye.